Okay, welcome everybody to the second day of our conference after an extraordinarily rich and inspiring day yesterday. Um, I thought by way of introduction for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I might do just a little bit of a, a kind of summary of what we learnt um, in the course of the day um, before I hand over to David Chandler who's going to be chairing this morning's first session. Um, so the day started off with a panel which Harsh um, chaired which was titled Submerged Imaginaries um, which I was quite intrigued by and afterwards I saw, saw why you'd called it that. Um, and we started off with Ivor Duncan, who is a PhD student at Goldsmiths University. Um, and he was interested in the way that a river in Colombia was used as a dumping ground for bodies. And so it became an archive of violence. Um, and he talked around that theme um, in his paper. Um, and this was followed by Pamela Gupta, who's from Johannesburg, who gave a very different take of the monsoon um, in exploring the sort of other than visual sensory um, qualities of the monsoon. She spoke about a monsoon perfume which kind of essentializes the monsoon into a smell and although she didn't talk about it yesterday in conversation this morning she says there's also a monsoon coffee which actually is, is about the kind of traveling of coffee beans uh, along the route carried by the monsoon. So there's some really interesting ideas about the, the sort of sensory qualities of the monsoon, which are more than just visual and romantic. They're more sensorial. Um, and how one gets submerged in that. And then the third speaker in that session was Jesse Ransley, who is an anthropologist from the University of Southampton, who gave an extraordinarily interesting paper of, of a community that lives on the backwaters of Kerala, and the way that the boundary of the village is something that's not drawn as a line, but that's something that is marked out by practices of everyday life. So where the village begins and ends is a sort of temporal thing um, that is practiced rather than drawn. Um, the second session was titled Liquid Matters and also had three speakers, Meghna Mehta, who's an anthropologist at the LSE, who spoke on the Sundarbans, which is actually very close to my students' um, work uh, this semester. Um, and she talked about, about the sort of politics of an embankment, which rather than protecting, actually creates the poor as the front line of disaster protection. So that was a wonderful kind of an extraordinarily provocative idea about the sort of modern Dutch embankment, which is creating vulnerability rather than protecting. Laura Denning, who's here to, to, um, this morning, is an artist um, at the University of Bath Spa who showed us a video that she's made um, titled Rhine and Hush? Hush? Reen and Hewish, you see my Welsh is pretty bad, or my West Country <coughs> pronunciation is pretty bad, in which she, she sh showed this really, really extraordinary, slow, quiet movie, which started to give us an understanding of the fog and the mist of the West Country. Um, and Pushpa Arabindu, he is at UCL, um, and a geographer stroke urban designer spoke on her work on latest work on Chennai where she's developing ideas of seasonality and temporality and climate as a way of reading um, the city of Chennai. And then the afternoon end with, with an extraordinary keynote by Anuradha Mathur and Dilip Dakuna, who are our colleagues from the University of Pennsylvania, in which they really critiqued the drawing of the line between land and water, and I think drew out some of the key themes that are emerging from this symposium. So that's where we were after yesterday. Thank you for being here this morning, and I'm going to hand over to David now. Do you want to use this? Thank you. So um, this morning's this morning session is on overflow and risk, and um, as we learned yesterday, you can't step in the same river twice, and I guess you can't step on the same piece of land twice either, and equally you can't go to the same conference twice. So um, if you weren't here yesterday, it probably won't matter because I think there's a lot of quite exciting stuff going on today as well. Um, we have three presenters, 
Unfortunately, the paper by David Wallace Matthewson um, won't be read. So we have Theresa Zimmerman of Antica Basca, who will be presenting on behalf of herself and Jayshree and Laura Videlli. So um, we'll finish, also we finish a bit early, so there's a bit of a break between the panel and the keynote. So we'll go in the order, people will probably speak for 20 minutes. So first up is uh, Theresa Zimmerman. She's presenting on Exceeding the Imaginable. Um, you could use this mic. In fact, you can sit down or you can stand up and use. I think there was one here, right? Yeah, is yeah. this working? Yeah. yeah. OK. But I think this is fine. Yeah. Yeah, I do uh, on the mic. Uh, no. So good morning. Um, I'm very excited uh, to be here today. Um, and I will speak today about the 2005 floods in Mumbai, which we have actually heard um, about yesterday already quite a couple of times and also seen some images. So I think you're well prepared uh, for my presentation. Um, even though I feel it's a bit of a challenge also to speak about the floods, as uh, some people in the audience might know it much better than I do or uh, the, the monsoon in general. Um, but I'll try to introduce a perspective today that uh, yesterday we did not speak much about, which is more coming from an institutional and also policy kind of perspective and how um, certain reactions were taken to that um, floods. Um, so what I will focus on today is how the perceived exceptionality of the 2005 floods in Mumbai enabled an interpretation of the floods as disaster, and more specifically, a disaster that can and also needs to be managed. This perspective is further encouraged by the international policy um, arena and the vocabulary of urban risks, vulnerability, resilience, climate change adaptation, and the like, which is further transported through uh, recent international agreements like the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, etc. Um, so by introducing some of the changes uh, taken since 2005 on the governance level and reflecting on them by drawing on insights from a field study um, in a northeastern suburb of Mumbai, I will suggest that the focus on rather technoc technocratical and material approaches concerning disaster management, flood preparedness, and risk reduction reflect a certain type of sense making um, that tends to neglect social inequalities and potentially also narrows the perspective on monsoon as disaster threat. Um, so just here an image, uh, this is obviously a very uh, uh, yeah, broad uh, map of, of the flooded areas in 2005. And here I show you where my uh, um, field study took place. So it was a, a suburb of Mumbai. Um, and actually one of the areas that um, have not been as much um, research or like not as much attention was put on these areas that are not the central parts of Mumbai along the Miti River that got heavily, heavily flooded as well. Um, so I conducted the research in 2015 and 2016 actually as part of my master thesis. Um, so that was 10 years after the floods occurred. Um, I recently started my dissertation project for which I'm trying to um, link disaster studies and critical urban studies um, by researching how urban riskscapes are produced, negotiated, and also influenced by global discourses um, that are further transported um, by international networks and funding agencies. Um, yeah, social science disaster research and political ecology considers disasters as dynamic social phenomena products of social action and extreme forms of experience. Hence, they are relational rather than absolute. Disasters are always political. They interfere with social, political, and planning landscapes. Um, and as, as disasters evolve at the intersection of a society's relationship with the environment, it is not sufficient to um, consider them as only social. However, the consequences and responses to them are socially constructed and they often trigger, like disasters often trigger social and political transformations. Efforts to respond to disasters and to develop post-disaster learning result from a process of interpretation, sense-making and meaning-making that typically reflect the workings of power, as Kathleen Tierney writes. <clears throat> 
The sociologist Martin J. Murray notes that seemingly extraordinary events um, can reveal not only the precarious um, balance between land use pattern and, nat and the natural environment, but also the stark inequalities in the spatial distribution of risk. Hence, it is relevant to consider how realities around disasters are constructed, why and how disaster governance takes place, um, how risks are considered in urban environmental policy making and planning, who are the beneficiaries of these processes, who is neglected, and what kind of conflicts emerge. I will be referring to the Mumbai 2005 floods as disaster, as they were framed as such um, by both authorities and affected people due to the unimaginable amounts of rainfall, the unprecedented and exceptional scale, and the devastating forms of impact the floods had. Indeed, the 2005 floods were um, exceptional in, certain, uh, in several terms. Um, first, the amount of rainfall. Um, while heavy rains and also flooding are very common in Mumbai, um, on, like in July 2005, the exceeding rainfall records were um, overtaken by large, and um, up to 60% of Mumbai's surface got um, severely inundated. Um, then uh, the human suffering was very big, like including the deaths of hundreds of people and uh, waterborne diseases that spread in the weeks after. Um, the uh, damage um, to residential and commercial establishments, vehicles, infrastructure, livestock, household items, and means to create a livelihood um, got, uh, was extensive and um, impacted mainly the, or also very much the marginalized groups of society. Um, the impacts on everyday life during the floods and also after were um, intense. Uh, many residents remained without potable water or food, without services, appropriate shelter for weeks. Uh, commuters got stuck and the, the communication system collapsed. What made the floods also exceptional, especially from a governance point of view, is that people from all parts of society were, um, like, felt the strong impacts and the authorities felt overburdened. In annual floods, it's mainly the low-income settlements um, that carry the major burdens. Um, <clears throat> but the geographer uh, Mona Lisa Chatterjee argues that whereas floods usually had created a certain degree of chaos, losses, and inconvenience, the deaths of 2005 made this event unusual enough um, to procure attention from government authorities and the general community. Um, now, being the financial capital of India with a very high population density, um, heterogeneous inhabitants and scarce space, the, the 2005 floods are often said to have revealed the vulnerability of um, the city. So I will now turn to what happened in the 10 years um, since the floods and focus on the like, governance levels. I will draw on two examples to discuss how the 2005 floods have altered perspectives on floods, on land and water, on responsibilities in the city, and eventually also on Munzin itself. Um, my first example targets the disaster governance structures in Mumbai, which were long existent um, before 2005, but con got considerably revised after the floods. Government officials and disaster management practitioners clearly attribute these changes to the experiences made during the 2005 floods and the criticism that was raised on the unpreparedness of agencies. Um, the floods are understood as a wake-up call, a focusing event for policy change, and also a milestone um, in disaster management. Many of these reactions um, on governance level um, are extremely useful, but also considerably based on technology, um, as well as engineering and management knowledge. <clears throat> While Mumbai was the first city to have an urban disaster management plan in 1999 already, um, disaster governance plans, uh, standard operating procedures, and control centers were considerably revised after 2005. The enhanced uh, Greater Mumbai Disaster Management Action Plan of 2007 and the 24 ward level disaster management plans define chronic flooding spots and also list op uh, standard operating procedures. The Disaster Management Unit, um, which is Mumbai's command and control agency, was upgraded into a self-sufficient um, control center built to withstand and outlast disaster. Um, that was after 2005. The control room, as you can see on that image, is fully equipped and operational around the clock. Dozens of employees monitor footage from thousands of uh, CCTVs and 60 automatic weather stations. They disseminate um, flood warnings, receive emergency calls, and coordinate emergency measures. The room was again upgraded last year 
and became now one of the best equipped uh, units of the municipal corporation. It coordinates between 24 ward level control rooms and emergency operators like the police and fireworks, uh, fire brigades. Sorry. Um, in addition to improving the handling of floods through disaster management institutions, the 2005 floods are also considered a turning point towards preparedness and prevention activities. They comprise of technology such, such as improved um, rainfall monitoring and warning systems, geo-information systems for vulnerability assessment and disaster response planning, pre-monsoon management, uh, ma management practices such as desilting of canals, trimming trees and also evicting urban dwellers, the dissemination of flood preparedness guidelines, um, as well as a better coordination among, uh, amongst institutions, uh, capacity building and also training of residents. Um, action was initiated to restore Mumbai's drainage and stormwater system by widening and deepening canals and installing pumping stations. To summarize, recent policies and plans interpret flooding as one of the largest disaster threats in Mumbai, and flooding is addressed by those institutional institutions that are also responsible to deal with communal riots, bomb blasts, or earthquakes. Um, they experienced unpreparedness in 2005, and the interpretation of floods as disaster hence led um, to technological and managerial disaster governance and preparedness initiatives, and changes in the built environment. Um, these are also showcased locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, and, uh, yeah. and other um, interpretations of flooding as, uh, and uh, thorough acknowledgement of power relations and social and spatial inequalities that led to the vulnerabilities um, are less present in these um, approaches. Uh, with my second example, I want to draw attention to how the 2005 floods are understood as an eye-opener and triggering point for the protection of urban environments and the mitigation of floods, um, where after conflictual measures, measures got introduced. The city's water bodies um, have received increased attention after 2005 um, through the realization that um, they are rivers and not just drains. An NGO wrote that overnight, Mumbai, India, and the world came to know that the Miti as, came to know the Miti as the river of death, with, which sunk a city of 30 million people. As response, visible, structural, and contested work is being undertaken along rivers and canals for flood control. In addition to the widening of rivers, concrete retaining walls um, have been constructed to brand, prevent overflow. Um, this is what we could see also like a concretization of the lines that um, were discussed yesterday. Um, <clears throat> to do so, thousands of households are being evicted. Mumbai's mangroves have um, also been target of new protection schemes. Even though mangrove protection rules were in place long before 2005, the mangroves are now increasingly being recognized as a natural defense barrier against floods and coastal erosion. Um, as is often reflected in newspaper articles as well. The destruction of mangroves has been listed as offense under the Environmental Protection Act, and India's first mangrove cell was created in 2012. Um, the cell proposed to install CCTV cameras for monitoring and to construct a wall around mangrove land. Um, just recently, the authorities also announced um, to clear all so-called illegal encroachments um, from the mangrove land until May this year. Um, while evictions of informal settlements take place along rivers and in mangrove land, um, the existence of larger scale um, development projects like the Bandra Kola complex, uh, the, the like business district, or Mumbai's airport that were once built on marshy land are not seriously um, questioned. Adding to Murray's quote on inequalities in the spatial distribution of risk, we could hence also assess the inequality and in the social and spatial distribution of risk reduction initi initiatives. Um, how are power relations reflected not only in the sense making of disasters and the identification of risks, but also in the decisions on certain types of risk reduction measures? Um, how can we understand um, disasters and risk governance in the processes of, um, in the larger processes of urban development? So these are also some of the questions that I will pick up further during my PhD work. Um, <clears throat> so now I will draw on uh, my field study site neighborhoods to, to reflect on these types of responses um, to monsoonal floods. Um, the, dis 
disruptions of the everyday and the presence of fear and formation of collaborative forms of practices are barely represented by these, um, the city's management responses. While the authorities appreciated the calm response of Mumbaikers um, during the floods and framed the mutual assistance as Mumbai spirit and resilience, um, residents of my field study neighborhoods, um, Sanjay Nagar and Dolat Nagar, um, described the floods as the biggest disaster we experienced and a slap on our face. It is the moment when personal suffering was huge, when life was threatened, when financial debt started, um, so mutual assistance was actually necessary to survive. Um, until today, reports about fear during the monsoon season are prevalent. As official disaster management structures are barely known in, this, in these neighborhoods, many residents felt and still feel a, um, a high level of uh, self-reliance and dependence on local um, social networks in emergencies and also dependence on collaborative practices. Um, so for instance, when it rains heavily, they check the height of the river and store goods on higher grounds um, rather than using the new app by the municipal corporation. Um, the number of uh, women self-help groups has increased strong strongly after 2005 as women experienced the positive effect of collaboration and mutual support. As um, Sanjay Nagar, which is one of the neighborhoods I, I looked at, which is a leprosy colony, um, so many um, leper patients live, live there. Um, um, as that neighborhood was um, affected more heavily than the neighboring neighborhood, residents of the neighbor, like the neighbors, came to rescue them and provided help throughout the days of flooding and the following months. Until today, these two neighborhoods interact, for example, in reciprocal uh, support during religious festivals. Um, um, and in a city which counts as very polarized in terms of religion, this relationship between Jain, Hindus, and Muslim neighborhoods um, which can at least partly be attributed um, to the commonly experienced floods is very special. Um, my second point is um, that the large number of evictions, uh, so this was uh, one of the, the women self-help groups. Uh, my second point um, is the, the large, that the large number of evictions for flood control measures and mangrove protection exhibit similar patterns in its implementation as evictions for large development projects and uh, infrastructure projects, and thus reflect also the neo neoliberal um, development paradigm. Instead of relieving people from the fear of floods um, through empowerment, new fears are added, the fear of being evicted, the fear of losing livelihood, um, or losing identity through replacement. Along the Dahisa River, um, where these neighborhoods are um, based, river widening and retaining wall construction activities um, led to the demolition of several houses, and other households have also received eviction notes. Um, so here we see that some of the houses are, have been partly uh, demolished or completely demolished. Um, some of the families have agreed to the rehabil rehabilitation for the larger interest of the people residing in the locality, but they ask for good alternatives instead. As many residents are leper patients, they fear societal exclusion and other, in, in other neighborhoods and also the loss of income sources. Um, tensions among residents over compensation measures started since the demolitions of houses began some years ago. Um, because some received apparently yeah, um, better um, compensation than others. This reflects what a public debate, uh, that a public debate was largely missing on what kind of risks individuals and society want to bear, which risks should be avoided through what kind of measures, and which consequences should be accepted in turn. To conclude, I want to raise three points. First, while a certain orientation towards monsoon and the prevention of destructing impacts had accompanied Mumbai's authorities and residents since long in history, the experience of um, feeling unprepared for the unimag in unimaginable and living through a disaster set free forms of uh, new forms of uh, sense making and practice. While the floods were considered exceptional and disastrous, both by governance and life world perspectives, and preparedness measures are taken at various levels, I want to argue that more holistic sense making processes concerning monsoon and the floods are needed. Um, Life world interpretations of rain and floods, knowledge on their local characteristics and collaborative practices to cope with them could be used to search for more holistic handling of monsoon in urban areas and also in, ex in its extreme forms. Um, second, not only the difference in social and spatial distribution of impacts of the floods, 
but also the revaluation of environmental resources and the identification of suitable um, risk reduction, flood prevention, and disaster management measures reflect power relations and inequalities. Certain measures, such as the construction of walls along rivers or the destruction of mangroves, are criticized by NGOs, um, but a deeper public debate on how risks and vulnerability are embedded within neoliberal urbanization processes are necessary. Um, for my last point, I will refer to Anuradha Matur and Dilip Dakunya, who suggest in their book, Soak, Mumbai in an Estuary, to exchange the lens of floods, exceptionality, and disaster with one that sees the city as an estuary embedded in the ordinary and everyday. In Mumbai, structures to cope with floods have been established, but coping with monsoon is not thoroughly um, reflected in urban and environmental planning. So following Matur and Dakuna, who argue that the war against monsoon has long been coming, I want to ask, like, if extreme forms of monsoon are leading to managerial practices, what happens to the perspective on monsoon itself? Is it being um, narrowed to a potential disaster threat, at least by the authorities? We'll have questions after the three presentations. Uh, the change of slide. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 yes. This is point, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. This one. I can do it. You can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Avantika, and I work with a small NGO called Care at Trust. It's a Chennai based uh, organization which is involved in research and uh, community based uh, environment management. So today I'll be talking about uh, water management challenges in a drought-prone uh, district of southern India. And in, in addition to the water management challenges, I'll be also discussing the ecological challenges which uh, come along with, uh, with the problems associated with water. And I'll be discussing it with the help of uh, three wetlands which are also protected areas located in the district. So coming to the uh, state in focus, uh, Tamil Nadu, as you see here, is, the, uh, is located in the southeastern part of the country. And uh, it's, it's called a water deficit state because the annual per capita availability of water in the state is uh, kind of low in comparison to the rest of the country. And uh, this has been primarily attributed to three main reasons. One being that the state receives low, low seasonal rainfall and that too during uh, the northeast monsoon season. Uh, here are the two maps uh, by the Indian Med Department, which shows the uh, normal monsoon pattern during the southwest monsoon from June to September, and the northeast monsoon uh, from October to December. And as you can see here uh, in the picture, that the state, in comparison to the rest of the country, receives only like 30 to 35 percent, while the rest of the country receives 70 around 70, uh, 70 percent of rainfall during southwest monsoon. And this is again because of uh, a mountain range called Western Ghats, which runs parallel to the western coast of the country. Um, so the state, uh, the, the state of Tamil Nadu, it receives like 50 to 75 percent of the rainfall during the northeast monsoon season. But then again, you can see there is high spatial variability in the amount of rainfall that the state receives. It's kind of more in the northern parts than the southern part of the state. And further, there is also spatial, spatial variability from the coast to the inner parts of the state. So uh, apart from the spatial variability, there's also high temporal variability, which is, can be seen in this graph, which shows uh, the trend in the October, November, December rainfall over the state of Tamil Nadu across uh, for the past 100 years. And we can see a very high year-to-year -year variability uh, during the northeast monsoon season in the state. So in addition to this, there are also very few perennial rivers in the state, which again originate in the Western Ghats. And uh, also large part of the state is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's covered by an extensive but like low, low storage groundwater aquifer. So uh, groundwater is also kind of low in the state. So again, uh, just reiterating the point, 
Um, this, here, this map here shows the onset of southwest monsoon in the country. And uh, you can see that the state is kind of sheltered from the Arabian Sea branch of the monsoon during southwest, during southwest monsoon. And also it kind of, kind of lies off track the, of the Bay of Bengal branch. In addition to this, now this is the district I'll be talking about, which is located on the southeastern part of the state. And uh, the northeast monsoon, the cyclonic, uh, the northeast monsoon, uh, the rain mostly occurs in the form of cyclones. And uh, this part is kind of buffered by it, the proximity of the region to Sri Lanka, and also because of the convexity of the coast. So uh, this is the district I'll be talking about, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, the, uh, Raminathapuram is a water scarce uh, district located in the drought prone region. Uh, this map here shows the percentage departure of rainfall from the long term trend of rainfall during the northeast monsoon in the district. And this is for last year that there was, the percentage departure was nearly 50%. Again, uh, as we can see in this graph, the percentage departure was like, it varied from around 31 to 70, 36 to 71% of the last. Uh, five years in the district during the northeast monsoon season. Uh, also looking at the probabilities of moderate and severe drought uh, during the past 100 years in the country, which has been calculated on the basis of rainfall deficit, uh, moderate monsoon being, uh, moderate, uh, moderate drought being, uh, uh, being understood as uh, 26 to 50 percent deficit rainfall, while severe drought uh, indicating more than 50 percent rainfall deficit. And we see that this part of the state is kind of more uh, vulnerable to both uh, moderate as well as severe drought in comparison to the adjacent regions of the district. So uh, the state and uh, state of Tamil Nadu, this water problem of water scarcity was overcome by traditional means of water harvesting through a system of tanks as early as uh, 200 BC. So tanks are basically low storage reservoirs which are constructed across uh, the drainage slope to, ca to catch the rainwater. And uh, there are like nearly 40,000, uh, traditionally there have been like nearly 40,000 in the state. Uh, the number has kind of come down over time. Uh, the tanks are basically utilized for irrigation, domestic and livestock use as well as fishing. And, and the state of Tamil Nadu has had a long history of settled agriculture with a system of uh, tanks, rivers, canals, as well as wells. And uh, apart from uh, supporting the livelihood options, the tanks are also very important for local ecology, groundwater recharge, flood mitigation, and they also harbor a lot of biodiversity. So these uh, tanks uh, used to be constructed by uh, rich individuals, the kings, and uh, as well as the local communities would come together to construct tanks but they were largely maintained by the local communities uh, using uh, local resources. In fact, the local communities would set aside a percentage of uh, their you know, agricultural produce or their levy taxes to raise funds for uh, maintaining these tanks. So these tanks traditionally have been called as eries in uh, the northern part of the state, as uh, Kanwais in the southern, some of the southern districts, and Kulams um, mostly associated with the temples, that, the picture that you see in the background the tanks which were associated with the temples. So these temple tanks kind of form the focal point for all the activities of all the religious activities and the, uh, uh, the religious activities in the villages. So. Okay, this, uh, pic this is a crude diagram which I've made to explain the basic structure of the tank. Uh, here you see, uh, this is the embankment, uh, the bun that's, uh, that's the tank bun, uh, which holds the water. And most, uh, some, sometimes the tank receives water only from its own catchment, in the case where it's called non-system tank. And sometimes the water is diverted from a river source or, ri or a reservoir nearby by means of a diversion structure called anicut through an inlet channel. Uh, in that case, it's called the system tank, and uh, the, the, the tank water spread area is the, uh, this area which actually gets flooded. And uh, these are the, uh, for the means, just an example of sluices, which are openings through which the water from the tank is diverted for irrigation. Uh, and the number of sluices would depend on the storage of the tank or, or, or on the topography of the irrigated area. 
and uh, the uh, area immediately above the water spread area is the uh, foreshore area. Mostly plantations would be carried out in this area to, you know, just to maintain the quality of water and also to prevent encroachment of this area. Uh, most of the time, the tanks would be arranged in a series that they either receive surplus water from a, uh, another tank in the upstream region, or they discharge surplus water to a tank down, in the downstream region, or both might happen. So this is uh, just to explain. So what happened was that in uh, this arrangement of tanks in the region helped in maximizing the utility of flash flows which occurred in the region in this arid area, and also it provides, provided a kind of flexibility in uh, water distribution in the state. Um, tanks have had a history of around 1,000 years, and uh, the rulers, the dynasties which uh, ruled that part of the country, they were like the ancient Pandyas, the medieval Madurai Nayaks, and the recent Setupatis, ranging from a period of 400 BC to more recent 18th century, have contributed to tank construction and excavation of channels, resulting in the form of a very advanced irrigation system in the state. So in this uh, picture here, you see uh, this is an abandoned sluice gate, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and these holes were the anchors of this sluice gate for you know, regulating the discharge of water. This possibly, the uh, records say that possibly dates back to 6th century. There were also uh, calibrations on the stone uh, pillars for actually you know, uh, estimating the level of water as, and uh, you know, <coughs> regulating the opening of the sluice gate. Uh, this is again an old structure which possibly dates back to the 18th century, while the new bund lies like it's, it's not visible in this picture. So also what really happened was that the uh, existing caste system in the region resulted in the partitioning of water in a way that uh, it uh, resulted in uh, you know, sustainable harvesting or it resulted in a sustainable harvest. Further dredging of the tanks was considered to be a meritorious act which a person could uh, you know, perform in his lifetime. Now, uh, this, uh, there are a lot of traditional folklore which is associated with tanks. I'll just uh, go into one. Uh, the area of the Konar caste, uh, they have some marriage customs which are associated with the tanks. Uh, wherein on the third day of the marriage functions, the uh, friends of the bridegroom will get a hoe and a basket for the, for the groom. And the groom would go to the tank and then fill those three baskets and the bride would come and then throw the earth, just indicating that they have constructed the tank for charity, remembering the importance of tank in this uh, arid region. And I also read out uh, these lines, which would you know, explain the landscape in a better way, uh, from uh, Spate and Learmanth uh, in a book uh, on geography of India and Pakistan. And this, uh, they describe it, uh, the land as, that this would indeed be a poor country, were it not for its intensive refashioning by hand of man. And this refashioning has been so intense that no stream left, however miserable, escapes unchecked to the sea without yielding up its toll of water. So further looking closely at the landscape, in the map here, it shows the distribution of the wetlands, which are largely tanks in the state. And we see a high dense distribution of tanks in the southeastern part of the state. And uh, taking a closer look, uh, we found that uh, you know, this unique uh, overlapping fish scale-like pattern, which you know, on the, that uh, list three image, it was kind of very, uh, a unique pattern which we could, uh, you know, we came across in the landscape. So, this uh, looking, so we went into, you know, just study the geomorphology of the landscape, means the, uh, the various uh, research, researchers who have studied the geomorpho coastal geomorphology of the state, and it was found that uh, sediment dispersion through uh, multiple, uh, through multiple terminal distributary channels, they resulted in this overall lobate shape of the delta, of a, of a river shape, a river dominated delta, which dates back to middle Pleistocene in age. And uh, further, the constant upliftment of land and progradation of the development of the delta, lobes after lobes resulted you know, in this unique uh, pattern. This here shows kind of a magnified view of uh, one of the lobes. So these lobes were, uh, were kind of, uh, you know, depositional mounds formed at the uh, terminal, at the distal end of the distributary channels. So these crescent-shaped concentric interlobal depressions, 
So here you can see that uh, this is the lobe and the interlobal depressions, they stood as favorable locations for the water to accumulate. And the people actually capitalized on this uh, knowledge of the landscape, of the topography of the landscape to construct uh, tanks uh, and to capture whatever water that was coming in the landscape. And uh, the district has uh, around 10,000 tanks uh, have been reported to be found in the district. So, so what uh, our study was uh, about uh, was about irrigation tanks as uh, bird sanctuaries, which are uh, protected areas dedicated for uh, uh, for protection, conservation areas dedicated for the protection of birds. So um, the tanks, they function as uh, wetland ecosystems in the otherwise uh, dry areas, harboring high biodiversity, including uh, the migratory waterfowl. Uh, there are a lot of migratory birds which uh, come from uh, Northern Europe and Central Asia, like uh, Northern Pintail, Northern Shoveler, uh, Gargany, etc., which uh, you know come to these tanks to nest. And large number of these tanks support heronaries, which are uh, you know colonial nesting sites of uh, large water birds. And some of these heronaries, while they have been known to exist for over a century. In other cases, the foreshore, the area which I had shown in the previous slide, and the tank bed plantations by the forest department in the state were crucial in the creation of uh, such heronaries. And the state has you know, recorded around uh, 100 heronaries. And uh, some of these heronaries were declared as birth sanctuaries, as, uh, as protected areas, with a working arrangement between the departments of forest, public works, and rural development on the issues of uh, management, ownership, as well as protection. And bird sanctuaries in Tamil Nadu, they largely focus on wetland birds, especially the colonially, colonial breeding species. And birds have been good indicators of ecology of the landscape because they tell us about the uh, water quality, the fish stock in the, uh, in the water bodies, as well as the surrounding land use in the area. So we focused, uh, uh, in this district, we focused on three bird sanctuaries in, uh, in this area. And uh, here is the uh, Gunda River Basin. This is one of the seasonal rivers which flows uh, through the district. And uh, we studied these uh, three bird sanctuaries which are located in the tail end of the basin. And uh, this tail end of the basin is known to be kind of, uh, show, the, the rainfall variation is high in this uh, tail end of the basin. Further, we see, again, a series of tanks which are arranged in a cascade, and nearly 92%, 90% of the tanks are hydrologically linked in this river basin. So uh, taking a closer look, uh, this shows the wetland the bird sanctuary's connectivity to Raghunatha Kaveri Channel. This is the channel which was uh, constructed by Raghunatha Setupatis, the rulers which uh, ruled the state from around uh, 16th to 18th century and this part of the state, in fact. And uh, they, uh, the, the water from Gunda River, which I mentioned in the previous slide, was diverted through this channel to feed around uh, 71 tanks in a cascade. And uh, here we see that one of the bird sanctuary, this is an isolated tank, while uh, the other two are, uh, you know, are part of a 12 tank cascade. So um, this uh, table here explain, gives the details about uh, these bird sanctuaries. Uh, while uh, this bird sanctuary is the smallest in area, the other two are uh, the largest being male Senvalur, Kiel Senvalur, which is located in uh, this part of uh, the uh, basin. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, that two of them are a part of a 12 tank cascade. Uh, for the, uh, while while Chitrangudi and male Senvalur, Kiel Senvalur are uh, own, are under the ownership of Public Works Department, uh, which means that these tanks are used for the irrigation of oh irrigation of area of more than 40 hectares. Uh, the ones which are owned by P, by PW uh, by Panchayat Union or the P, this, this are irrigate, uh, are known to irrigate an area of around uh, less than 40 hectares. Uh, our, we used a conciliant or multidisciplinary approach to study these, uh, these uh, bird sanctuaries. 
and the study showed that uh, traditionally there was a symbiotic association uh, between the tanks, the uh, agricultural area, the birds, as well as the people. And the bird droppings, which enriched the water of the tanks, they served as enrichment for the paddy horticulture cultivation. And uh, birds used the agricultural fields for foraging and tanks for nesting. The seasonal, uh, the dry, wet dynamics was synchronized well with the breeding of the water birds. Further, the sentiments which are associated with bird protection were observed across all the castes in the villages. And, uh, you know, people would not burst crackers during the festival just to protect the uh, birds. And the arrival of birds was considered as a key indicator to monitor local climate change, uh, local climate, uh, a good harvest, and a good fortune. And eventually, the, these villages uh, came to be defined by the birds. However, the changes in the landscape and the changes in the management of uh, these tanks from over the years means the management initially by the local community is changing hands to revenue department, to public works, and now to the forest department, resulted in a conflicting set of scenarios. Uh, it was found, uh, means I'll just discuss some of these scenarios. The management practices which were aimed at uh, increasing the bird density coming to these uh, sanctuaries uh, resulted in, you know, sometimes the bird number would be pretty high uh, during some season, resulting in crop damage. So that symbiotic association was kind of, you know, uh, changing. Uh, the presence of a large number of birds in the fields also made them very vulnerable to poaching. Uh, and uh, further, though the agricultural fields were necessary for the sustenance of the birds, the extensive use of fertilizers and pesticides in the agricultural fields was kind of detrimental and toxic to the birds. And uh, also the decline in agriculture in this area because of, again, tank degradation has uh, you know, presented another conflicting scenarios. So also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of these, uh, wet, these uh, tanks, uh, um, the forest department, they had uh, planted uh, acacia, one plant species, uh, in the foreshore area and sometimes also in the tank burnt area to prevent uh, soil erosion and to strengthen the uh, than in the foreshore area, but then uh, it was found that this also presented a set of conflicts. Conflict because as soon as this area was declared as a protected area, uh, the people could not actually uh, generate revenue by felling of the trees, and uh, also after uh, they by felling of the trees, they couldn't collect silt from the tanks, and this uh, and the spread of the acacia and the tanks also aggravated water stress in the region. Uh, since I'm already low on time, I might just as well read out. Uh, wetlands that, uh, it was found that wetlands that continued to be of significance for agriculture were accorded greater priority for maintenance rather than ones which were not, they were losing their importance for agriculture. Lack of desilting and other rehabilitation works also kind of uh, went on a back hole after their declaration as uh, protected areas. And uh, further grazing and fuel wood collection, which were earlier managed by customary rules and self-regulation, uh, kind of, you know, it, they were stopped by the forest department, resulting in that, you know, disruption of the connection of the people with the tanks. And people also used to, con you know, cultivate the dry uh, tank beds during the summer season for uh, generating livelihood. But again, this ha stopped because uh, of their protection. And also there was cessation of uh, fishing leases, which would happen in the summer season, which would actually keep a check on the invasive species. So this eventually resulted in the complete alienation and collapse of the traditional system of management of these tanks. I'll just quickly run over this slide and I'll finish it off. Uh, another problem in this uh, region is the invasive species called Prosopis, which was introduced in the 1950s as a fuel wood uh, in the dry district in the state. And uh, it, uh, prolonged, pe dry periods, prolonged dry periods has led their invasion into the tank beds. In the map here, it shows uh, the bird sanctuary, which has been completely taken over by process light green color. And uh, what people have done is since the agriculture is coming down, they have actually capitalized on this uh, pr presence of process in the area for uh, making charcoal. And there are a number of small scale industries which have come up. Now, but then this process ecologically is uh, detrimental to the landscape because it, it impacts the water flow, the water supply, as well as impacts the biodiversity of the region. And uh, in fact, in fact, it uh, also affects the grazing potential as well as the nesting potential for the birds in the region. And the uh, uh, Forest Department has been finding it a problem to control uh, the invasion of Prosopis because of lack of funds. They have 
problems where they cannot sell processes and because of the also uh, rapid invasion from the surrounding landscape. I'll just skip this. So eventually what really has happened because of the wetland degradation is that the wells are growing dry which were actually effectuated. The recharge was effectuated by these wetlands the well, and also there is a problem of salinity intrusion. Uh, and over the years, the tanks are actually losing their significance as a heronary. And uh, in some of the tanks, the birds have not been coming to breed for nearly two decades. Here it shows uh, the carcass of, uh, of uh, painted stock. So I'll just conclude by saying that since the tank management is governed by a multitude of departments, all these activities should be undertaken by different departments. Uh, to manage the tanks in the region and also the historical symbiotic association the, the people had with the tanks needs to be kind of mainstreamed into the management plan. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. And final presentation is uh, Laura Fredelli. Laura's from the, the University of Tours in France and she's going to be talking on integrating flood risk in urban and architectural projects. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. I first have to apologize for a couple of things. First, my poor English, and second, the fact that I don't have a very structured and well-prepared presentation, so I'm not reading the paper, so please be patient. Um, I am trying to uh, start from the idea of flood-prone areas or floodable zones in Europe and making a kind of comparison with what can we learn from Europe, European example and try to translate it into Chennai's area. Uh, as we saw yesterday in the um, keynote speaking, in Europe we can make a very strict line between what is floodable and what is not. And it's a kind of very easy and very easy to see in rules and laws. Uh, we tried to um, analyze some recent urban design and urban uh, architecture project in France in different places about how uh, the flood risk is integrated in the project. How do you follow the rules and, uh, and it very quickly led us to um, ask ourselves which kind of city do we want to build. The first things we were very naively waiting for was that constraints may lead to innovation in architecture and urban projects, which is absolutely not. And the second things is that we came out at the end, we were not expecting, is that using the flood risk argument uh, allow uh, practitioners and uh, local authorities to prevent any contestation against gentrification. Uh, we analyze very different projects and the first uh, things that we find out is that it's kind of very easy to cope with the regulation in, in France with some hydraulic solution. I mean, how you, you still build in flood prone areas following some rules about where the water can flow eventually, uh, wh how many uh, land you move from a place to another to make embankments and this kind of compensation for environmental reason is kind of very easy to do from a technical point of view. And then, from in terms of aesthetic of architecture, we find out that all the projects are kind of copy and paste on the same kind of rule. First, semi-underground parking, because then you can kind of uh, balance a part of the eventual flooding, which gives you a very unfriendly uh, architecture from the road point of view, because you always have this kind of uh, waterproof walls overlooking the road. The second, where you uh, still have entrances of private houses uh, on the road, you have this kind of elevated walkways uh, with kind of fence that always define different semi-private from the public uh, walkways. Then you always have ground floor spaces 
for shops who are never sell, sold because nobody is buying these kind of small shops, retails, uh, in places where you have very big malls, etc. So you, you kind of sacrifice some square meters, but then you can build very fancy housing, which are more expensive than ordinary housing, and you use this argument to say that you, you are making standing housing, so you have a kind of known planned gentrification, which is kind of uh, made possible by the fact that you are respecting the flawed rules. Uh, and at the same time, you are, we, we already uh, saw it yesterday in more than one presentation, a kind of heritage re development of the waterfront where you use identity, memory, existing building that can be reused, etc., in all this area to make it even more gentrified. And we have some very clear example where we can, we can demonstrate that the new, um, the new area which was built I cannot use it, but this is the green, the, the yellow there, which was built the, uh, by a house or rent a house is something like 30% more expensive than in the average of the town, which is six. So uh, it's a clearly gentrifying uh, effect. And where all this idea of nicely living, a nice uh, quality of life, and rebuilding this overview or overlooking on the water and making a kind of buffer zone, which is also relying on this idea of flooding uh, through fancy green spaces, etc. It's uh, very often used. And then we ask ourselves, uh, what of this conclusion can be applied in Chennai? Is there a possibility of seeing the same things or not? And the answer is partly yes and partly no. Uh, I've been working in the last five years with uh, Anna University and Rukumani will present in the afternoon and Radin Vedamutu especially and uh, we exploited as much as we can our master students to make part of the ground and uh, field work uh, because we cannot be there as long time as they can so uh, we are uh, managing to have two to three students for one semester a year since five years so we're kind little by little overlapping information and, and going on. Uh, and the idea is to work on Chennai. Uh, we already saw it yesterday, but in, on Chennai you have uh, two months when the monsoon is very uh, concentrated in terms of how much water you got and is um, inversely related to the number of days where it rains. So it's, it rains not very often, but very heavily. And we very quickly came to the idea that um, you have disaster, you have major floods. And Teresa already spoke about this. This is disaster management. It's something which is another competence uh, from the one we have. So this is the 2015 uh, major floods in Chennai when they had to open the dam of the Chamarabakam Lake and all the city, the old what is pink has been totally flooded. And this is the Kuturpuram Bridge, which is something we will find again uh, later. Uh, and the idea is that um, urban project can very little against this disaster. But you can also have something which is ordinary, regular, accepted flood under monsoon. And yesterday I found that I can use a word to <laughs> to during the, the, the keynote. Uh, they can use a word to define this, which is this wetness. And the idea is that during the monsoon, water is everywhere, but nobody considers it flooding. People are just putting slippers on, walking in 10, 10 centimeters of water, and we walking with their umbrella. And the perception of what flood is is absolutely not the same as in Europe. Anytime it rains in Europe, we have to drain it very quickly and put it into some river corridors or something and get rid of it. Here there is a kind of consciousness, more or less far, in big cities like Chennai, but that the monsoon is something that you need. It's something that brings life. And nobody is feeling that these two months where you have a lot of water is a, a permanent flooding. But still, how do you cope with this? ordinary, well-perceived, and totally acceptable 
flooding, which is absolutely unacceptable in Europe. Uh, a couple of uh, students of us uh, made this um, simulation about Tours, so in France, where you can very easily get access to the data, get access to some model that gives you a kind of vulnerability rank. And here the line is not only drawing the difference between water and land, the, the line is drawing embankments. So as we were saying yesterday, if you see up there, there is a, I, I can look, uh, yes, if you see it here, you've got the, the perception that there is an entire district in the water. While it is not in the water, it's just on the wrong side of the embankment. So it's totally floodable, <laughs> but it's still on the land. And when you go through this kind of European way of preventing or trying to analyze what the flood risk is, you have a lot of data available and a lot of model available, but which means that you kind of make it unhuman or dehuman. You have no vision at all on what difference between different neighbors, forms, different classes which, which are living in, the neighbor, in these neighborhoods. You, you can very quickly calculate how long it takes to be out of the water uh, risk, etc. cetera. Uh, and you kind of do not need anything else than statistical data, which is absolutely not the case in Chennai. We tried after the 2015 um, major events to start with a kind of typology based on how far you are from the water, uh, the, play, I mean the, what, the place where the river is supposedly uh, flowing, uh, we, 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 what is the highness of the buildings, which kind of form you have, etc. And uh, we, we went on this here, always in this idea. We selected a certain number of neighborhoods along the river. Uh, river, I mean, you have two rivers in Chennai, which are um, seasonal monsoon river at the beginning, and which are made now um, perennial through sewage. And people are really thinking they are sewage. I mean, uh, one of our um, PhD students uh, came out with the idea that if you ask to someone in Chennai, what do they think about rivers, they just tell you w which river. And you say, come on, there are two rivers. No, this is just sewage. They don't even, they don't even see these places as, as rivers. So we, we choose a certain number of uh, settlements along or neighbors or districts along uh, the Adia River. Uh, the first one is uh, an informal settlement. The idea was to see if there is any adaptation uh, of the spontaneous architecture uh, in a place which is very vulnerable because one of the major reasons for the slum clearance board to clear the slums and replace them somewhere else is the fact that they are under the threat of the flooding. But when you see where they are replaced, which is a, uh, mostly another wetlands, uh, you realize that it's probably not the only reason because also in India, these places along the river are becoming valuable land. The second one is a state uh, planned uh, district. Uh, to replace uh, people who are living in kind of uh, spontaneous um, district. I, I'm not taking the time to explain all these things, but uh, if you have questions, I can give you all the details. The third one is a kind of medium class uh, district, and the last one is a very fancy, very recent uh, uh, neighbor. Through some previous works and some selection of models, etc., uh, we have we, we f digged out a, a list of indicators so, uh, about how can we define a uh, level of vulnerability for each one of these districts. And we still miss in this year, but we will do it next year, uh, to cross with the geomorphology, geology, and capacity of the geology to absorb water, so to have an idea of where you can refill the water table. And uh, last, uh, where were the ancient tanks that were, that were filled and that, from my point of view, are places where you can be flooded much 
easier because, I mean, the, the water system, the, the tank water system that Rukmani will present in the afternoon is something which is man-made, but it's man-made on an, on an existing uh, possibility. So it's not just you dig e everywhere. You, you dig where water is already kind of going by itself. So um, I think that places where tanks were filled and built up uh, upon it uh, are more vulnerable than places where it never, a tank never existed. And I start uh, on the map looking at all the roads that are called tank road and where there is no tank anymore, thinking that overlapping this with an historical map will allow me to know uh, where were where some of the tanks. Um, the problem is that uh, our students, for some schedule reason, can only go there from January to, to May, which means that they never see the monsoon. So I am, because I can only go November, October and November, I am the only one who sees the monsoon. So I, I'll make this part of the survey during the monsoon. And um, of course, they applied uh, the six uh, criteria to the four uh, district and came out with some let's say vulnerability assessment, which shows that if you take the zero, apart from the distance from the river, which is something you cannot change, all the other criteria are more than zero for the fancier uh, uh, districts and less than zero for the two poorer one. Which means that, and someone already said yesterday, uh, the weaker uh, inhabitants are even more vulnerable to, uh, to flood risk. So these are the four, uh, the four districts and this uh, vulnerability uh, assessment. So uh, this one, which was the one planned by the state, uh, is as vulnerable as, almost as vulnerable as the uh, spontaneous one, which means that no attention is paid by, not by the state that uh, is um, commanding the project funding the project, nor by the practitioner, which are urban designers or architects, to reduce the, this vulnerability with something which can be very easy and that we observe in the richest uh, neighborhoods, which is, for example, not having this ground floor line exactly at the pavement uh, level, which means that any monsoon will have 10 to 20 centimeters of water inside your house. And, and I'm in the time, to conclude. Um, in France, uh, the legal definition of what a flood is draw a very clear uh, constraint and very clear rules. And the modelization and this copy and paste effect in the architecture make that it's very easy to dehumanize uh, the urban project in response to risk. And the public stakeholders, as well as the practitioners, can hide behind this security speech uh, and make some hidden uh, gentrification. In Chennai, you have a much more uh, less operational regulatory framework. And the boundary between what is flooded and what is not flooded is absolutely not as clear, as simple to identify as it is in Europe by the legal point of view which means that uh, the vulnerability has to be built case by case on very specific and small uh, surfaces, which means that you have a much more human approach to how to you deal with this kind of flooding, specifically the regular, ordinary, accepted uh, flood during the monsoon. And the approach is, has to be much less abstract. You can much less modelize what do you do and how do you do it. And so we can observe still part of the same uh, perverse effect in Chennai as in France. Uh, where you are building some secure buildings in f close to flooding spaces, you are kind of uh, making a gentrification which is well accepted because you are using the, uh, the word risk uh, vulnerability, and you're saying why we are answering to this. We have to make uh, more costly uh, 
architecture, and this allows you to shift from something that can be affordable to something that is necessary, uh, destined to higher classes. So, uh, so that's all. Thank you. Uh, we want to finish maybe 10, 15 minutes um, yeah, earlier sure. so we can have a break before the keynote. That's okay, but that still gives us about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, I thought all three presentations were very rich, they had a lot in them, and I guess in different ways they're all discussing how monsoon and other waters are integrated into governance, reproduction of economic and social inequalities, and I guess cultural, religious ways of being. So, I mean, it's free which Anyway, you're, the, you're here. So I'll take a few questions at a time. And if you say who you are and take the microphone, although you might not need it. So, yes. Anthony, just. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, great. I think it's very nice selection to see from range from academic to activism perspectives in terms of the key issues. Um, I'll start my question for Theresa. Um, when I wrote my paper on the 2016 Chennai floods, I looked for a lot of academic references on the 2005 Mumbai floods, and I found very little material. There was almost no academic scholarship. And uh, so first is a very pragmatic question of if when you decided to look at it 10 years later, if, whether you actually reflected on why it still remains quite an understudied topic uh, in terms of uh, urban issues. And so I like the idea of bridging disaster studies and urban studies, but from urban studies perspective, stud floods still remain quite marginal in terms of focus. And, uh, and even like speaking to people six months after the floods in Chennai, a lot of them were very um, skeptical about uh, uh, of uh, you know the consequences and the action, saying that people forget and move on. So whether ten years later you felt that same kind of attitude, like we've forgotten about it and we've moved on, and maybe some of the actions and the uh, reactions are may, may not be necessarily attributable to the floods, and perhaps you have triggered something there that was not in the memory. So that was my question to Theresa. And to Avantika, it always frustrates me in Chennai that the environmental lobby is extremely fragmented. In a sense, it's quite nice because it's very rich in the sense that you have different sides of the debate and you have multiple voices and it's quite nice. But at the same time, when it comes to tackling some of these issues, larger issues, uh, you find them not presenting a very coherent front. Um, so in the case of Pros Prosopis Juniflora, it was very divided as to whether they need to go or there is a clear, you know, marginal economy, subaltern economy attached to it, so let's, uh, you know, face the facts. So I wondered whether how you as an activist group encounter some of these uh, heterogeneities. Maybe I'll keep the question for Laura. Laura? Oh, can I? Okay. Um, just an observation about this idea of regulation, um, regulatory frameworks, uh, which works in Europe. In Chennai, uh, one of the things we find is this rule through the state, which is very different from this notion of a regulatory state. And uh, whether you could develop that a little bit more theoretically, this distinction between rule and regulation, and perhaps that might help you bring a a more nuanced analysis uh, to the comparison. So, Anthony, you stopped doing the microphone? Um, so, there was Lindsay, and was there anyone else? Okay. I'll probably shake the room down if I put the microphone. Is that too loud? <laughs> That's fine. Um, I have a question um, for Teresa, also inspired by something that Laura said about um, how when one person's studying rivers or when one person sees rivers, another person sees sewage, um, and about governance always being, or you know, disaster management, or set, calling something a disaster always being political. Um, I see something similar in um, coastal management, a coastal management dispute in Ireland, where environmentalists and surfers are talking about something completely different when they talk about protection, coastal protection, than our developers um, and local corporations and stuff. 
So I was just wondering, could you talk about the difficulties maybe of going and studying these things where you might be talking, you might be talking about something completely different than the person who's, t for who's facing you, that things like, things like flooding, things like rivers, um, things like governance, um, just is there, is, there, is there a problem, a kind of a theoretical problem or a paradigmatic problem in, um, in analyzing these things in the field? Um, thanks very much. That was three very rich papers. Um, I, I have two question stroke comments. One for Aventika. Um, there's some new scholarship, actually in a journal called the Anthropocene Journal, um, that, that kind of builds an argument that the tanks in Tamil Nadu were built in a time when there was previously El Nino volatility in, in climate, like centuries and centuries ago. And they're kind of looking now to the kind of movement to revive the tanks as some kind of acknowledgement that we're entering this very volatile El Nino phase again. So I wonder if you'd like to comment on that and the sort of initiatives to revive and restore tanks and what the, what the motivations are for that and, and whether, what you think of that. Um, and secondly, oh, actually my second question is for Teresa. I mean, I'd like to mention Pushpa's work on the floods in Chennai, where she's really questioned this notion of the exceptionality of the flood and, and actually really digging into this kind of myth of the exception and how that's mobilized politically. And have you done any critical work on that in relation to the Mumbai exceptionality argument? Thank you. I think that's some questions now, and go in the same order as we presented, if that's okay with you, Teresa. Sure. Uh, so there were quite a couple of questions. I will try to um, talk on all of them. Um, so first, concerning the academic research on the Mumbai floods of 2015. Um, it was actually quite interesting because I, I wanted to start my presentation with a quote of one of my first interview partners that actually said, like, why do you study the floods? There has been done so much work on it. and. <laughs> Um, uh, it was not much more than waterlogging, actually. And that, in, in like first arriving in Mumbai, it seriously um, troubled me and concerned me, like, is this useful what I'm doing or not? Um, but then eventually being there for some time, and actually I was there during the Chennai floods, um, so I could sort of reflect on what happened in Mumbai and what happened in, Mumbai, uh, in Chennai. Um, I found that um, it is useful to do much more uh, research on it, actually. And so I, um, I found some perspectives in, in academic papers quite useful, which came more from a sociology perspective, looking at vulnerabilities and the production of vulnerabilities. Um, but then I found that um, a lot of other work um, always used the same kind of framings and the, the same kind of arguments, um, which are similar to the, like the ones that I um, sort of mentioned when I talked about the exceptionality of the flood or the perceived exceptionality, like the large amounts of rainfall, the drainage system and so on. Um, so I think it, it could still be useful to do further work um, from different kinds of angles and linking also um, disciplines. Um, and indeed from like more critical urban studies, I did not find much on it. Um, the, the question about uh, disasters as um, political and um, how, how different, d difficult it is to engage in, in such kind of research. Um, I found it quite um, difficult. I think for me, especially coming from outside, it, it was an, a, a further challenge and I have not experienced the, the floods myself. Um, so, so I sort of relied on what I could read, what I could listen to and, and like the, the kind of framings that other people used and um, and also in like even though I, s I do speak Hindi, I didn't speak Marathi or Gujarati, which is like some of the other languages that other people spoke. So I also worked with a translator. So obviously it was very difficult to um, to grasp the, the different um, understandings of of these um, the rainfalls and floods. Um, but I think the the way people refer to it, um, and I, I spoke to a large variety of, of people. Um, was always very different to one another. Um, so for instance, the, the people in my um, field study area, they usually didn't really call it a flood, but rather when the water came. So it's this, I guess, more like the seasonality which was uh, referred to yesterday, like sometimes it comes and sometimes it goes again and sometimes it 
stays away for some time, but then it comes again. Um, and in 2005, it came much more heavily than they were used to. Um, yeah, so it's, I, I find it difficult to, to engage in this kind of work, but um, also highly interesting. <laughs> Um, then questioning the exceptionality, so uh, Pushpa's paper was actually uh, published after I did my initial work on this, um, but I did read it uh, recently and found it very interesting. Um, so I, I, like as I tried to make clear, I, I refer to the, the floods ex as exceptional and disastrous as my interview partners and a lot of literature did so. Um, but I think it is important to, to question this um, kind of exceptionality. And, um, but um, as I wanted to sort of point out is that at least from a, a certain point of the authorities, it is now very much framed as, um, like it, the learnings from 2005 are used to, to now frame flooding as, as disastrous and disastrous. Answering uh, Pushpa's question, it's like, first of all, we are not an activism-based organization. We uh, are a research-based organization. And uh, uh, your question about uh, the problem of prosopis, we feel that it needs to be managed in a more you know, site-specific manner rather than you know, having a general law which says that, OK, go and remove all the prosopis, like Madras High Court uh, gave an order saying initially to remove and then put a stay on it. The, you know, realizing the importance of prosopis in certain parts of the state. So, uh, means we uh, would suggest that uh, the, the uh, planning has to be more uh, site specific in that case because the impact of prosopis on biodiversity and water is kind of scientifically proven uh, by a number of research studies. So, that cannot be, you know, discounted for. Uh, but then it's. Uh, importance in the livelihoods of the people also cannot be, uh, you know, uh, uh, disregarded in, uh, at least in this case, so for some of the very semi-arid districts of the state. So um, that's what I feel. And uh, uh, about uh, 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 Lindsay's question about the tank uh, restoration uh, in, the, in the state, uh, I think uh, tank restoration uh, started uh, quite uh, early uh, in the state, in fact, because uh, the deterioration also started uh, uh, quite early around in the 18th, 19th century when uh, the management kind of changed hands from uh, the local people to the revenue and the public works department. And the engineers uh, really didn't have much idea about how the water was actually managed uh, in the tanks. So. But then the restoration scheme started uh, that time. There was also an act uh, called the Compulsory Labor Act where the people were actually kind of you know, forced uh, into uh, manage, uh, means uh, repairing the tanks. But then uh, again, the system is kind of uh, going into disuse so over, over a period of time. And, uh, but recently, more, many uh, restoration works are being carried out uh, by the Public Works Department in collaboration with uh, uh, a national uh, agricultural rural development bank. So hopefully things would look better. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, about rules and regulation, you're perfectly right. Um, the idea is that we were not working on rules itself, but on what is the uh, attitude of the practitioner toward the existence of the rule. And in France, it's very extremely framed. So you perfectly know when you answer to a a call, what do you have to put in your file to be accepted in, in terms of building infrastructure areas. And in China it was much more flexible, so the idea was just to see how, how it works with, with two kinds of different regulation, but not to work on the reg not yet to work on the regulation itself. But you, you're right, and this, this thing, distinguish between rules and regulation is part of the things we should dig out. Um, about the fact that we are talking about different things. Yes, this is one of the major problems. We, were, we arrived in China in 2011 uh, with the idea that we could treat river as we do it here. And then after a couple of years, we discovered that we had no subject at all because river means nothing. <laughs> and, and, and after 2015, when everybody suddenly discovered that there is a river and you can be flooded. And so, so it's 
to all the time is like this. And of course, we don't, none of us, French, I mean, and I'm not even French, speak Tamil, so we are translating from French or other mother tongue language to English, and then someone from English to Tamil, then translating back to English, which means that half of the message is lost. Um, and is particularly visible in Chennai, but it's not only in Chennai. I mean, we had been working on a common project with some Dutch university before, and we spent something like six months to get to a consensus about what a float prone area is. Because if you take the French, the legal framework, it covers 70% of the Dutch territory, so it was absolutely unacceptable. And we, we had to negotiate to find something in the middle, uh, and it, it's already within something we all call flood. So it's one of the biggest problem is this, and, and this is why one of the PhD students student choose to, to analyze analyze the perception or representation of the river into upper classes because she can speak English directly with the upper classes which is very stupidly <laughs> easy and of course you don't have any access to the other classes but it's at, at least a start where you have an easy access and then in the following years we could get in touch with some classes who do not speak English but yes it's one of the biggest our biggest problem um, I think we have some time for some final quick questions, if you wanted to. Um, I have, I have one which can wait. Yes, at the back. And then Dilip from me. Anyone else? Um, thanks for all the presentations. Um, my question is to um, Laura. Um, and um, you were speaking about the sort of, shall I stand up so you can see? Yeah, please. Um, you are speaking about the rules and, and regulations and um, I just wanted you to say a little bit more about it. Um, the building in sort of um, flood plains um, must come with um, forms of insurance um, that enable that to, to happen. Um, and right now, um, insurance companies are developing models, and I was very interested in models that you're discussing. Uh, catastrophe modeling is also an, um, an important element within finance as well, so I, I was interested if you could expand on that. I'm sorry, I missed the first presentation. So, I mean, if I may comment on the comment, actually, and then, uh, and then another, another point. But I think the, you know, when we were in Bombay, actually looking at this, at this landscape, I mean, the, the idea actually of the sewage versus, you know, sewage versus the thing, I think is a very critical, is a very critical question, actually, because, uh, for example, the Miti, I mean, it's called a river today, but it wasn't actually an overflow system. To understand an overflow system as opposed to a flow system, is a very different, I think they're very different beasts, at least for us mm -hmm. as designers. Uh, and so when we designed, you know, a situation like the Miti, we designed actually an overflow system rather than a flow one, which meant actually that it was a holding and treatment ground. Uh, so for us, it was a big, I mean, you know, to some extent it is not about whether it is, you know, carrying sewage or carrying water. It's a question of actually, in terms of design, what one is actually seeing as constituting what people call rivers. Uh, that's, uh, that's uh, one point. The second is actually when we, when we met people there, they did not see a flood, as you point out, you know, when they said this water was coming. Mm. But again, it wasn't a question of seasonality. I mean, I think that that is sort of, I think, being a little, uh, uh, these, are, these are issues actually where water never came, uh, you know, at some point in time where people lived. You know, so I think there's a certain romanticizing actually about people living with this kind of rise. Uh, they never lived in this kind of situation before. Uh, but uh, the way they put it to us actually was that it did not come from anywhere, it just rose from the ground. And so, the, so basically the earth was so soaked uh, that it just, you know, it just kept rising and rising. So it wasn't about coming from somewhere, you know, it was basically uh, rising from, from the earth, and which was actually for us, and maybe it was just the way we listened rather than, rather than the way they said it. 
uh, and uh, which, uh, which of course comes to the point of translation. I mean, to me, it's not about translation, uh, but it is, it's more about uh, actually beginning to, to situate what people are saying in a world uh, that they are coming from and sometimes even misrepresenting. So, uh, you know, for me, it's not an issue of language, but it's the issue of imagination, actually, that one brings to the question. And just a point on Prosopis, if I, you know, and uh, restoration, tank restoration. Uh, the idea, actually, of, uh, uh, that has been applied to restoration has never been in relationship, actually, to the alternate system that has killed tanks. So when one speaks of tank restoration, even today, many people talk about it as a system, um, and which is right, but they don't speak about the necessity, actually, of, of, uh, of getting rid of the system that destroyed the tanks. So, uh, so basically, restoration is always an incomplete project. Um, and it never takes, first of all, the entire system into account, but it uh, doesn't, doesn't take into account, actually, that the river system, a flow system, has destroyed a holding system. Uh, and so, you know, it's, uh, these, these tanks are, are bound to move into disrepair and, uh, and uh, this thing. So it is just these two systems are not seen, actually, in terms of design More together. More cohesion rather than... My question is for Laura. Um, I'm actually just, I'm sort of still struggling with this myself, and I was just interested in asking about certain usages of words which um, several presentations yesterday and today use, and I suppose the kind of doom and catastrophe moment uh, where we think, you know, the world is coming to an end. Uh, I wonder what the usage of words like resilience or adaptation or vulnerability or kind of, um, yeah, the other ones, I don't know, like just disaster, management, uh, flooding, uh, kind of wh whether you think there is actually in these words themselves a kind of myth ma making and taking forward the sort of same modernist project of creating a bit of an alarm around something that then, um, and, and where these words come from, or if there's any sense of trying to understand and locate the kind of language we've, you know, people have started using, um, which maybe sort of almost reifies things, uh, like vulnerability, I mean, words that I also used in my presentation yesterday, but yeah, just on the language and where these words come from. Okay. Um, I had a question, I think inspired by Avant stuff around irrigation, which is, and I guess also for Teresa in terms of how we construct threats, but um, why is it that the focus is on flooding rather than drought, and what does that do in our discussions of our relationship with water? Because clearly we're not trying to fence it in when we're doing irrigation, we're trying to turn a line into a plain and redistribute, so it would seem that modernity and the struggle of the human is not just about forcing water into lines, it's also forcing it out and into the world. And how would that enable us to reflect on our discussions yesterday? So those are my questions. So let's go in the yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so thank you for your comment. Um, I would just like to pick up on one point, or what I think is, is quite interesting is that what um, I think your comment reveals, and also my experiences in, in Mumbai, is that um, what happened in, in 2005 and also what, what is happening in, in other years, um, I think is very, like the, the um, experiences are very different from one another. So for instance, in the field study site that I did research in, um, the, the floods or the, the water was very much associated with the river Daisar. Um, as it was very like located just next to the river, and it, it was more experienced as an sort of overflow. And that time, like the, the, the river was more like channeled in, in a sense. Um, so the people experienced that the, the water came from, from the river and sort of pushed them um, to the outside. And it was even associated that um, a flyover bridge that was constructed inside the riverbed, like by some people, it was um, mentioned that this intensified. An annual flooding, and for others, the exact same bridge became a point of rescue in the floods. Um, so I, th I think like the point I want to mention make is that um, 
it's it's very like both individualized and also like the different localities um, have very different experiences. So um, this should also be in, incorporated in in ways of understanding, um, yeah, monsoonal rainfalls in the city. Um, question about uh, managing, uh, you know, trying to manage systems in isolation is kind of difficult because, again, looking at the entire landscape, you have the catchment area, which might be possibly with the forest department, and then you have the river, which might be controlled by the public works department, the fishes by the fisheries department, and as you come over by the revenue and the agriculture department. So the multitude of departments which are involved in the landscape is, is a number of them, and to actually you know, bring together an overarching authority which can, you know, give, uh, try to, you know, give guidelines to each of the department to actually manage the whole system holistically for the benefit of people is kind of, uh, it's kind of difficult, but then uh, probably that's what, we, you know, we can hope for that something that comes up which kind of takes a more holistic view of looking at things uh, would be a good idea. And... Uh, we come to the question of looking at the flooding and the, and the drought. Uh, it's like <laughs> kind of the seasonal dynamics of the landscape uh, uh, where, uh, you know, it would be like capturing the rainwater to tie it over the drier season. That's what uh, probably the irrigation tanks function as, not really just as irrigation. Uh, they have been kind of uh, uh, associated with other forms of activities which would happen uh, within the village. So. They can't be, you know, kind of uh, directed only for irrigation. But then, that's what uh, the significance of tanks has been about in the landscape, uh, like capturing the rainwater when it rains heavily, and then kind of, you know, helping the people to kick, you know, tide over the dry period. Uh, yeah, uh, about the building in floodplains. Um, France decided in 1995 that they are stopping with the reinforcement of the bank, of the embankments and that they can give some space left to the rivers. Um, but, I mean, they can afford it because if you look at the geomorphology of France, these areas covers only the 5% of the national territory and it gives you a very, again, easy uh, um, speech about these zones because you can use these places where you remove urbanization to something else. And this goes back to, to the second question because is that perfect place where you can speak about sustainable development, which is one of the words uh, that were kind of in your list. Because once you say we cannot build anymore in this area because they are flawed under flood risk, you can say then we can make sustainable development. You can make environmental sustainable development because there are no more conflict about what do we do with these lands and we can reconvert it for environmental sustainable development and partly social because you can say okay now we can re make reappropriation to the river inhabitants and the river and highlight some heritage historical points and these kind of things. And about do what do we can still do uh, in floodplains is uh, based on uh, national uh, rules uh, which used the ancient cartography of all the flooding, previous flooding, uh, to define perimeters and boundaries. And inside these perimeters and boundaries, you have four levels of risk, which are calculated uh, looking at the highness and the speed of the water. And in first and level first and two, you can do nothing anymore. And so there are um, places where the entire municipal uh, territory is inside uh, level one or two, so they, can, they have to totally stop the urbanization, which means that they don't know what to do because still in France, for a mayor, development means urbanization. Uh, and in level three and four, you can still do something according to very strict rules. If you, if, if you already have a level of urbanization, which, which you can densify, and the law doesn't define what already urbanized means, so you, it's up to the, each municipality to directly negotiate with the state. If one house every 200 meters is already built, 
or already urbanized or not, and if, if you can densify or not. So it's also based on negotiation and kind of power each municipality can have in diluting this, this rule. Uh, so, so the idea is you can still build and you have to follow the, some rules. The rules are leave places in, in terms of geography, in terms of geometric form, leave the places for the water to flow, so do not put buildings which are stopping the water to flow, so all the orientation is uh, along the river. Uh, replace all the land that you dig out for the building somewhere else where you can compensate uh, this movement of land. Uh, then is having uh, places, I mean, not having people sleeping in places that can be flooded. So you can have temporary or ephemeral activities, you can have parkings, you can have shops, but not housing. Uh, unless you are four meters higher than the level of the highest water known. Uh, I mean, it's a kind of kind of very strict and complex rules and you, once you, you know, then you know exactly how to cope with and, and how to uh, propose something that will be approved by the legal framework in terms of architecture. Um, and about the, 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 the list of words uh, you were saying, um, apart from disaster management, which is definitely not my competence, uh, all the others are used in a very uh, different way according to the context. Uh, for some, resilience is just the capacity of a place looking at the traditional architecture in France, which were, was already taking into account the possibility of a flooding, and then where the buildings are built uh, in, in a way that can survive a flooding, uh, is considered as resilience. But from the law point of view, it's not considered as resilience because it doesn't answer all the contemporary requirement to be considered as flood resistance, uh, resistant. And same for adaptation. Adaptation can be uh, interpreted in very different ways. So we we had some we had selected for the project in France some definition which were overlapping the idea that we wanted to look at in terms of resilience as of adaptation and as vulnerability. But you, you can find very different definition and you really have to, to choose the one that is more close to what your idea is. Because otherwise all these words are kind of meaningless because their the definition is so wide that you can put a lot of different uh, point of view inside. Thank you I don't very know much. if it answers. Thank you very much. Uh, let's, I'd like to, you to join me in uh, appreciating our speakers for their presentations and great questions. <laughs> uh, I wasn't able to sort of finish early, so we're going to have a 15 minute break now. So we'll start with the keynote at quarter past 12. Okay.